Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar titled College 101, Focus on Finances. I'm Dana Vosberg, Director of Manning & Pierce Family Wealth Management Service, and I'm joined by one of my Manning & Pierce colleagues today, Rebecca Galliford, a wealth management consultant on our Family Wealth Management team. Uh, Rebecca will be covering key planning concepts and investment vehicles to consider in order to save effectively for college. We're also excited to be joined by Jody Rosenshine Atkin. Jody is an independent college admissions counselor, and as you'll see, has a wealth of knowledge about the college admissions process and important financial considerations that come into play with your children, grandchildren, or maybe even you yourself think about going to college. So before we begin, I have a couple of housekeeping items to cover. Uh, if you have any questions throughout this webinar, please feel free to submit them at any time using the question box on the right-hand side of the screen. Uh, when we conclude uh, today's prepared material, we'll spend any remaining time answering questions that you may have submitted. If we're unable to answer your question due to time constraints, we will personally follow up with you after the webinar. Uh, for your convenience, a recording of this webinar will also be available within the next several business days. Um, so we'll be covering this, this topic by addressing really the full timeline of college planning, as you can see on the agenda right here. Uh, beginning with how, how to get started, which is certainly an important uh, step for new parents and grandparents. Uh, also, investment considerations along the way toward college, uh, the wave of new concepts and complexity that develops as students and families begin their college search, and what happens with saved uh, money left over after college. So, a lot of great information to cover. And uh, Becca, please uh, kick us off with an important step in the college savings process, which is really just how to get started in the first place. Yes. Thank you, Dana. Uh, and um, I probably should have included why in this title also. Um, so why the cost of college has continued to increase um, by inflation of 3% higher than that of other goods. So if we have inflation of 3%, then that means college has been inflating at 6%. Um, in New York State alone at a, at a SUNY, you know, um, state-funded school, um, all-in tuition, books, room, and board, um, that right now is approximately 26500 uh, on an annual basis. Um, private schools are typically more, with the University of Chicago coming in at the first school to be over $80,000 on an annual basis. Um, and according to a study by Sally May, about 34% of all college funding is covered by parents' savings and income. Um, so that's the why. And then we kind of look at this chart here. Um, why is it important to start early? So the earlier you start, uh, the more the account has a chance to grow. Um, so this chart, you know, $100 monthly contributions over different time periods with a 5% return. You can see after 18 years, you know, you have just under $35,000 in that account. Um, if we're going to a, a SUNY school, that's going to get us one year of tuition and maybe a little bit of the second year. So, um, and, and a fun fact, if we went to the five-year route, in order to save as much money as we did over 18 years, we would actually have to save over $500 a month. Um, at that five-year range just to get the same as if we did over an 18-year um, time period. Um, accounts, you just need the Social Security number for the, the beneficiary or the, the child. I kind of use both of those interchangeably um, throughout here. And actually, in the case, uh, Dana, if you want to move to the next slide, uh, we'll cover our first plan type. Um, 529 plans actually don't need um, the child to be started. If you're a young married couple and you're planning on having kids, you could start an account now, name yourself as the beneficiary. Um, one of the benefits of a 529 plan is that you can change the beneficiary um, as, as much as you want. So you can start it for yourself. Once you have a child, you can actually then name the, the child. Um, okay, so we get to 529 plans. I think a lot of people, when they think about college savings plans, this is kind of what comes to mind. Um, it is an education-specific um, savings account that provides both tax and financial aid benefits. Um, they are state run and most states have a plan, although not all of them. Um, and you're not limited to investing in your own state's plan. You can invest in other state's plan. Um, the reason why you would probably want to invest in your state's plan is because most of them give you a tax benefit on your, on your state tax. Um, so there are two types. There's college savings and prepaid tuition. Uh, they really sound exactly like that. Um, College savings is saving now to pay for college later. Um, prepaid tuition is, is paying a portion of the tuition now for the future. Um, with that type, you need to be a little bit more certain about where your child wants to attend, although it doesn't have to be definite, but it does kind of 
make things more, um, you have to know where your, your child's going to college and that's something that, you know, at, at one years old, that's really hard to kind of to, to determine. Uh, <laughs> not only will their desires change, but their academic record may not reflect dad's ambition. Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. Um, so assets in 529 plans grow tax-free, and if they are used for qualifying educational expenses, so tuition, room and board, books, et cetera, um, they're distributed tax-free as well. Um, they can be used for lifetime learning. So you're not just limited to the four years of undergrad. You can use them um, for graduate school and beyond. Actually, Joji shared a, a, a tidbit with me that people in retirement now are using these leftover assets to take classes in retirement, which I find very, very interesting. Um, and uh, with the new tax law changes, tax law changes recently, um, some states even allow for them to be used for K through 12 um, tuition as well. Um, there is a maximum investment limit on the accounts, um, usually upwards of $250,000, um, which seems like a lot, but then if we think about University of Chicago times 80,000 times four, we, we could be maxing out there. <laughs> um, Parent-owned accounts are included in the um, FAFSA calculation, which Jody will cover what FAFSA is shortly. Um, but that means about 6% of parent assets are expected to be used to pay for college, which the, the 529 is included in that. Um, Grandparent-owned accounts are not factored into the calculation that way. Um, and then with the, the annual contribution, you can, you can contribute more, um, but up to 15,000 annually without triggering the gift tax reporting. There is another uh, option of doing 75,000 upfront and splitting it out over five years. Um, but, you know, we can, if you have any questions on that, we can kind of answer that on a more one-to-one um, -on -one basis. So that's a 529 plan. Um, the next one that really the, the other major kind of plan would be the, the UPMA or the UGMA. Um, they're kind of interchangeable, and those stand for Uniform Transfer Slash Gift to Minors. Um, these aren't necessarily a specific type of account, but mean that you open an account in the, in the name of the child and in their Social Security number. So this one you can open ahead of time. Um, but then you have a custodian named to take care of the account until the child reaches the age of majority. Um, that could be a parent or grandparent um, who's making the decision. Um, each state has their own age of majority. New York is 21. Some states are as low as 18. Um, these are not education-specific accounts, so they don't have the um, tax and financial aid benefits. Um, however, you can use these assets for anything beyond um, education. So you can use it for education, but then it is also there if, the, if they need a car or, or, or anything that kind of falls out of the purview of, of a qualified education expense. Um, so the assets do not grow tax deferred um, and any income generated over $2,200 annually is taxed at the um, trust and estate tax rates. Um, but typically at the, at the, these account sizes, you're not really gonna generate income more than that. Um, these can be opened relatively anywhere, so that they aren't state run, you aren't limited on your options. Um, you can open it with a bank, you can open it at, at any kind of custodian that you kind of really choose, and you also have freedom of the investment type. So with the 529 plans, um, it's very specific on um, what you can actually invest in. In an UTMA, you can invest in basically, you know, whatever, whatever you want to in that, in that account. Um, these accounts uh, are considered assets of the child as opposed to the parent. Um, and in that case, that means that 20% of the account on an annual basis is expected to cover college costs. Um, even if the grandparent is the custodian, it is in the child's social security number, it is in their asset, it needs to be included on the FAFSA. Um, failing to report that actually could lead up to some prison time. <laughs> I, I, I had to look that up. Uh, this one also, you can contribute the, you know, up to the 15,000 annually, um, gift tax free. Uh, if you do more than that, um, you do have to um, do gift tax reporting on that amount. Uh, and so those are the two major accounts. We're just kind of cover a little bit about these other four types here. Um, you know, traditional IRAs, Roth IRAs, they both grow tax deferred. Um, with a traditional IRA, your contributions might be tax deductible. Um, 
and then in both the traditional and Roth IRA distributions to higher education are exempt from the 10% 10% early withdrawal penalty. Um, but in both account types, you have an annual maximum contribution of 6,000. The other part of this is that you're not opening this account for the child more than likely because you have to have earned income to actually make those types of contributions. Um, and in some cases, you might actually be phased out of even contributing to, to either account type. Um, the Coverdell education accounts, so these were kind of the, the main accounts before 529 really kind of came along. We don't see these used all that much because the biggest point of these is that the contribution limit is $2,000 per child from all sources. So if, if parents want to contribute, grandparents want to contribute, it's $2,000 a year max, which is why we typically don't see these used anymore. Dropped in the bucket. Yeah, today's <laughs> college cost. Yes. Yeah. Uh, lastly, we have minors trust. These function very similarly, similarly to how the UTMA, um, UGMA accounts do. They're held for the child until they turn 21. Um, the income is distributed similarly. They're, it does not grow tax deferred. Um, again, we don't see these used very often because um, you have to set them up and you have administration costs. You have to tip, uh, visit an attorney to set these up. So. Um, if they function similarly to UTMA, but we don't have to do the, the cost with visiting an attorney and actually setting up a trust document, um, you know, we, we may not typically use this type of account either. Okay. All right. So investment considerations. Um, so I briefly touched on that 529 plans offer more specific investment selections. Um, in a lot of ways, they act as a glide path where you can pick an aggressive or a conservative approach, and then the plan itself will take the assets and move them from more aggressive to conservative um, as your child gets closer to needing to use that money. Um, however, for, for all other account types, so what should you consider when you're, when you're thinking about investing the assets? Well, you need to consider the time horizon. How long are we going to be holding onto these assets, um, and when will we need to be using them? Um, what's your tolerance for volatility? You know, even if we have 20 or 18 years before we start college and we can't, um, even in that long of a time frame, we, we don't want to see a lot of dips, then we may want to be a little bit more um, conservative than aggressive with our account type. Um, what other assets do we have available? So are we investing in this account and this is going to be the sole account used to pay for education? Um, or is this an account that, well, some of it will be used for education, but it may um, actually outlive the life of, of the child going to school and be used in, in past that. So do we have a longer time frame? Um, and then do um, what happens to the, the, the account after the, the child is done with attending school? So maybe they even went to graduate school and we still have money left in the account. Well, what, what happens with that balance in that? Um, so those are really the things that we would consider um, as far as making investment, picking investments in the account. Very similar to the just the concept of nearing retirement, and so the shorter, you know, similar. You're, you're thinking about a, a time horizon and a, in a sense a, a target in, in the future, and and you want to make sure that you're managing for that, and you're not setting up uh, the, the the portfolio to be exposed to certain risks, and that's that's really the, the key here. So, great, thanks, Becca. Yeah. So I think uh, Jody now is going to cover the litany of different uh, financial aid vocabulary and the complexity that goes along with that. So, Well, I think sometimes parents need a dictionary to get through some of the vocabulary because most of it is unfamiliar when they start with their first child. The first thing I'd like to cover is the FAFSA, F-A-F-S-A. The FAFSA is shorthand for the Free Application for Federal Student Aid. My personal First piece of advice to anyone who has a child who is going to college is fill out the FAFSA. Even if your investment people and your accountants say you are not eligible for financial aid, you have too much money, fill out the FAFSA. Why? Because A, you don't know when a crisis is going to strike your family, if there's an unexpected death, if there's an unexpected critical illness, where your situation is going to change on the head of a pin. And the second is, at some schools without FAFSA information, your child will not be considered for merit aid. So you need to just fill out this document. There is no charge. It's ornery. It's uncomfortable. It's an irritant. Fill out the FAFSA. Okay. <laughs> FAFSA provides $1.5 billion in grants, in loans, and in work-study funds. 
So if you fill out the FAFSA, your kid is eligible for a subsidized work experience at college, and those generally pay higher wages than turn in hamburgers. Um, the FAFSA will also help you calculate what is the EFC, the expected family contribution. That is how much money any given school will expect a family to provide for each child in an academic year. The EFC, the expected family contribution, may vary from school to school. Okay. Then there is something called, now remember the FAFSA is free. Anybody who wants to charge you to fill out the FAFSA, there is no charge to fill out the FAFSA unless you hire someone to do it. You're not supposed to hire somebody to do it. It's free. Okay. Then there's the CSS profile. This is administered through the College Board, those same lovely folks that bring us the SAT tests and the AP exams. Um, it should only be filled out and only submitted for those schools that ask for it. It is a piece of information that you do not have to share unless someone asks for it. It applies to about 300 colleges and includes some scholarship programs as well. It is not free. There is a fee to submit it to each school. Much like you pay to have your SAT sent to each school, you will pay to have your CSS profile sent to each school. Okay. Need blind admissions. What does that mean? Need blind admissions means that a school is looking at your child's application without any indication that they are or are not requesting financial aid. There are some schools that say that is a totally separate experience, but there are others where they are not blind and they are what we call need aware. Somebody's got to pay to keep the lights on. And so to say that every school should be need blind means that some school could end up with a class full of people who don't have enough money to help them keep the lights on. So it is important to know which schools are need blind and it is important to know which ones are need aware, because if they're need aware and you're on the bubble and you can afford to pay it, you're going to have an advantage. It's an unfair advantage in the context of equity and access, but the bottom line is that being able to pay the bill will, in some circumstances, make your child more appealing to particular schools. Net price calculator. The net price calculator is on every single school's website. It is mandated by the federal government that it be there. If you can't find it readily, just put it in the search bar at the top of every school's webpage and you will find the net price calculator. It refers to the amount of money that you will be expected to pay at a particular school based on their history of families that financially look like yours and kids that academically look like yours. So you put in the numbers and they spit out a, a number back to you that lets you estimate what the cost is. Um, you can enter the information, you can do that anonymously, and you get an idea of what the annual cost is for families that are similar to yours. Why should you do that? And I know we're gonna say this later, but I wanna say it 100 times. Don't try on the dress you can't afford. That's what they tell all the brides, right? Don't go in there and try on a dress that's $30,000 if your budget is $1,500 because nothing else is ever going to feel as good as hand-spun silk. So don't go applying and falling in love with schools you can't afford. There are many schools you can afford. So let's try to limit the search options to the ones that are viable. Demonstrated need. Demonstrated need is the calculation that is done by the school that says how much they think you can pay. Demonstrated need is the gap between the cost and your expected family contribution. Just because they say you can afford to pay $30,000 doesn't mean you have $30,000 ready cash to pay doesn't matter. That's not their concern. They've got algorithms and calculations and they say this is what you can pay and then your demonstrated need is the difference between cost and expected family contribution. Some schools are committed to meeting 100% of demonstrated needs. That does not mean that they are free. It means that they are committed to saying we will fill that gap. 
Not all schools will do that. And you can find, or people like myself can guide you to, the numbers that say this school typically meets 67% of demonstrated needs. Then you have a hole, right? It's the gap. And that gap has to be filled somehow. And that becomes the challenge. Okay. Now, when you get a financial aid package, it's going to talk about scholarships, it's going to talk about grants, and it's going to talk about loans. What is a scholarship? A scholarship is a gift. A scholarship is an award given by a school, by an organization, by a government. Basically, anybody who has money and wants to give it away can package it as a scholarship. They do not have to be repaid. It is a gift. They do, however, they can potentially have strings attached. So, for example, if you get a leadership scholarship, the contingency may be that you have to participate in particular leadership opportunities on that campus. Um, if you get an athletic scholarship, that is contingent upon your meniscus remaining intact and your rotator cuff staying healthy. If you can't play, they don't have to support your athletic participation anymore. Um, some of them may be dependent on your major. Some of them, many of them, may be dependent on you maintaining a particular GPA, a grade point average. So if your grades fall into the sewer, the money is going to be gone. And every kid who has a scholarship ought to know what the rules are around keeping that pot of money active for the four years. Grants. Grants are also gifts, but they are generally based on need. Um, they are usually awarded based on your financial cir circumstances, but they can also reflect what is known in the industry as tuition discounting. Because University of Chicago wants $80,000 for their education. There are not many people who can peel off $80,000 and hand that over. Um, so there may be a, a grant from the school to say, Dana, we're so glad you're coming. Here is a $10,000 um, Dean's grant, okay, it's tuition discounting. It's, it's the way they lower the price for people they want to attract. Um, again, a grant is a gift. It does not have to be repaid. So what does have to be repaid? Ah, the magic loan. This is where it gets tricky. How much is it okay to borrow? How much can we, I'll just go to the bank. I really want to go to University of Chicago. I'm going to go to the bank and I'm going to find $80,000. The rule of thumb that I use in counseling families as to how much money a student should borrow, and I do believe that students should have some skin in the game. This is not a four-year paid vacation and exercise in intellectual curiosity. They ought to be having some skin in the game. But it is okay to borrow across four years a total of as much money as you expect to make in your first year out of college. So if you're planning to be a teacher, let's, you can go on the labor department websites and find out how much teachers typically make. Let's use $40,000 as an example. Then a student who wants to be a teacher can afford to borrow in their own name $10,000 a year. And if they do that, when they graduate, they will be able to pay not only the interest on that money, but they will touch the principal. If the money exceeds the amount that they make, like you borrow 70 and you make 40, you're gonna struggle to make those interest payments, but the interest will continue to compound. You'll never pay off all the interest and you'll never touch the principal, which is where we get this debt bubble that so many young people are drowning in. So. Actually, before we move on that, yeah. so one thing we talked about was that a lot of schools now have, have more of a five-year degree Path. Now, would you say that you should split that amount over five years and not, yes, not get ten thousand dollars for the fifth year? Right. That is an excellent point. Some schools, particularly schools that have co-op, those require five years. So then you need to split your annual bar annual income over that five-year period. Um, and six years is a long time to take to earn a baccalaureate degree. So then you're into a whole different ball game, and I'm not sure how you would even calculate that. Parents and students, to be responsible about their borrowing, should be looking at what percentage of students at that college, and again, this is a number that's readily available, what percentage of students at that school graduate in four years, graduate in five years, 
or graduate in six years. And if they're not graduating, you should ask somebody in the admissions office what's happening to the 20% of people, like you have a 65% four-year graduation rate and an 80% graduation after six, what about that other 20? Because if you don't graduate and you've borrowed that money, you still owe the bank or whoever the borrower is, the lender. Good question. Okay. So when we talk about loans, we want to talk about interest rates. We want to talk about federal direct subsidized loans, federal direct unsubsidized loans, federal parent plus loans, and private loans. And they're all different. Direct subsidized loans. Those are the best. Those are the best for a lot of reasons. They have the lowest interest rate. They are based on need. They cannot exceed the amount of money needed to go to school, but you don't have to worry about that because no college is going to give you a direct loan for the total cost of attendance. The reason they're called subsidized is because the Federal Department of Education, which gives the school the pot of money to distribute, pays the interest on that loan while you are enrolled, plus six months after you leave school. So you're not compounding interest from the day you sign that loan. So federal subsidized loans are the best. Okay. Then you get federal direct unsubsidized loans. You do not have to demonstrate need to get these. The interest rate is a titch higher. And a school still determines how much you can borrow based on the cost of attendance and the other financial aid that's in play. The interest on this money, however, begins the day you sign for the loan. So your freshman money will cost you more than your senior money because you're going to have three more years of interest on that before you start to pay it back. Um, so that's the unsubsidized loan. Private loans are not borrowed from the Department of Education. They're not guaranteed or subsidized by the government. Students who have not yet reached legal age will have to have somebody co-sign for them. And the interest rates can vary over the life of the loan, so it's hard to predict what you're going to end up owing at the end. They are eligible, however, for public service loan forgiveness. Um, the notable differences about these are that they have some federal, federal loans have loan limits and eligible use and options to suspend payments. We didn't have the Parent PLUS sheet here, but I just want to mention the Parent PLUS loan is a loan that is made to a parent. It runs about two points higher than any loan made to the student. It is made on behalf of the student, but to the parent. And so you're going to carry that loan, mom and dad, if the kid drops out, if the kid says, I'm not paying it. It's your credit history that is on the line with a Parent PLUS loan, and they are expensive. Again, they were last time I checked, they were running two full points ahead of any of the federal loans. So caution um, when using those monies. They can't be consolidated. It's hard to get them forgiven. Jody, do you find that those are more common now or recently? With... Parent PLUS loans? Yeah. I think they had their day. Mm -hmm. I think enough people got burned by taking them that the word is out on the street that one should exercise caution about those. Um, but again, as these costs go up astronomically, there's no way to predict for your one-year-old daughter what it's going to cost to send her to college, and you're going to have a gap, and how do I fill that gap? So um, they may have a resurgence. I certainly hope not. Um, again, I'm going to say it again because <laughs> it's like a mantra. Do those net price calculators. Do them before you go visit the school. Do them before your kid falls in love with the computer science program there. Don't try on the dress you can't afford because nothing else will ever feel that good. Thanks, Joey. That's what? good advice in a lot of uh, areas of life. Yes, yeah. <laughs> and so we'll, we'll move to then, uh, you know, if you, you uh, did a great job and you've actually overfunded your uh, savings for college, uh, you know, really what happens next? And Becca, what are your thoughts there? Well, uh, first of all, if you've, if you've managed to do that, congratulations, because um, as, as Jody discussed, you know, loans and things are, end up being more prevalent that should we, we need to use those to cover our funding as opposed to um, actually having enough saved to cover that maybe $80,000 a year to the University of Chicago. They're probably going to come and 
in, in a, send us a, a, a nicely worded email if they ever hear this. Um, so 529 assets. Um, so if we remember they grow tax deferred and if we use them for education expenses, they are um, tax free. Now, if we need to take the money out and not use it for an education purpose, education purpose, um, there is a 10% penalty on the assets. And then on top of that, any um, amount that the, the account has earned, so, so we have the principal of what we've put in the account, and then on the earnings on that, we actually will have to pay um, tax on the earnings as well. So there's a couple of ways to combat that. Um, one would be, so as I said, you can use it um, for more than just undergraduate degrees. So if we, if we want to use it for graduate school, um, we should do that, or we could potentially save it and use it to take classes in retirement. Um, you can change the beneficiary. So say we have an account for our two children and the first one finishes and there is a pool of money left in there. We can actually name our second child who's still in college um, to that account and, and use those assets um, for, for the second child. Um, you can pull the money out and, um, and, and pay the tax on it as well, although um, you know, that, I think that would be the, the last thing that we would want to do for the assets. Um, for the UTMAs, well, so they don't have the, the tax benefits like the 529 um, at accounts do. But with that, you know, if there's money left over um, after school, it, you, you can still be used for, for any expenses. Um, the, the one thing I will point out, though, we kind of talked about the age of majority. Um, a lot of parents are uncomfortable that uh, when their child turns 21, they may have access to this account because when they do reach age of majority, um, as a parent, you no longer have a say of, of whether or not they can actually go in and, and withdraw those assets. Um, so just something to consider with those account types as well, but there are no penalties. Um, and if you do take money out, you would just pay a um, more than likely a lower tax rate because it would be capital gains as opposed to, to an income tax rate. Yeah, and Beck, I would just point out too, with, with, if you have you know overfunded a 529, there's money left over, um, what well, you've mentioned before is just even if there's a penalty to take the money out, you potentially deferred tax for a very long time. Yeah. And, and you know, if you want to be strategic about it, you could look at it from the standpoint of if there's a low tax, low income year where you might have a lower rate, even with the penalty, at some point down the line, there is potentially some benefit there compared to if you just had the money invested in, in a taxable account. So just, you know, that, that power of the tax deferral can, can continue to help you uh, way down the line past college. Yeah. So. Um, so one of the, the kind of the other part we'll talk about here. Um, so this we're talking about 529s and the impact on financial aid, um, and maybe a little bit for grandparents too. But the next slide we'll we'll cover that a little bit more as well. But um, so if we're making gifts, um, if we make an outright gift to the child or to the student um, on the the FAFSA purpose for FAFSA purposes, um, that's going to count as income to the child, and that. Um, depletes their amount of aid or their, their need by 50%. So we would want to say an outright gift is probably not the best way to, to help them. Um, also with that, you are limited. Well, you can gift up to the $15,000 on an annual basis without um, having to trigger the gift tax um, reporting. Um, but if you do more than that, you know, it will go against your lifetime exemption. Um, if you make a gift, outright to the school, it will still count as that 50% of income, but um, you do by bypass the need to, um, to, to write off that as, as part of the gift tax. You can do more than $15,000 if you make the gift directly to the school. Um, one of the things to consider, though, um, if you make a gift of tuition to the school directly, um, that does limit the amount of tax-free money we can withdraw from the 529 account. Um, there's not penalty on that money, but you will have to pay tax on the earnings. So a good example of that would be, um, say the, the student owes $20,000 and you gift $10,000. Um, they can still pull the $20,000 from their 529 account, um, but because we've paid $10,000 of it already, only $10,000 will be um, tax-free and the other $10,000 you will have to pay pro rata on the earnings in the account. Um, and actually, I point out that applies to scholarships as well. There is a calculation, um, so it's not exactly dollar for dollar, but if your child does end up earning a scholarship um, and they have a 529 account, you can take the money out of the 529 and 529 in the amount of the scholarship, 
um, and you will not have to pay the 10% penalty, but you will have to pay the um, tax on the earnings um, on the earnings in that account, and that is again pro rata. Um, so it won't be every dollar you earned up front; it'll be a, a portion of that. All right. So kind of we we've talked a lot about I think mostly you know parents and how to get ready um, for their children to attend school or for your child and and what you need to be thinking about, but um, you know, I think we have a lot of people who are in a position as grandparents to want to help out their grandchildren and their, their children. And so um, what are kind of the best ways to do that? So um, like I said, gifting uh, really can kind of um, be a detriment to the kind of need that a child can receive because they're, they're getting that much income coming in. Um, so we would say probably opening a 529 plan would be the best because as we're as it's calculated on the parents or it's not calculated on the parents FAFSA. Um, <clears throat> however, once we start withdrawing from that, it, it still is in, included as income. So um, we would say for a typical four-year undergrad attendee, um, you would want to start making gifts and their uh, what is it sophomore no junior year the the, the third year. Um, because when you're calculating the FAFSA, there's a, what we call prior prior, yeah. and that when they're looking at income, it is from two years prior. So prior year, prior year. So for students who are going to go to college in 2020, the FAFSA is based on the parent's 2018 tax return. Yeah. So if we're going to take a grandparent gift for a kid who's entering college this year in 2019, we wouldn't want grandpa's money to come into the FAFSA calculation until their junior year, until 2021, because then it won't impact the... Yeah. So if we are making those those gifts of income, whether it's, it's outright or it's from the 529, we would wait until the junior year to do that. Um, but... When possible. Right. But in the 529 account, it is not considered a parent asset, nor is it um, considered a student asset, so it does not... Um, in, in that regard, it also benefits them from um, being excluded from the, the calculation. Um, if grandparents open an account of a 529, the parents can also have an account. There's no um, limit to, to who can have an account for a beneficiary. And on top of that, um, here in New York State and other states have different policies, but for New York, um, there is up to a $10,000 deduction for making contributions, and if the parents and the grandparents both have an account, they both are eligible for that deduction um, if they're both contributing up to that amount. Um, um, and then the... Um, Oh, and then the grandparents also have the ability to take the, the account and change the beneficiary as well. So just because you have it for one grandchild or one grandchild, you can actually spread it out um, over, over multiple grandchildren. So you could just have one account that you've been putting money into, and then you could use it uh, as, as necessary. Yeah, um, that flexibility is, is, is helpful for grandparents just because you don't, the time they'll start very early if they're funding it, and you don't necessarily know. How many uh, grandkids are going to be, right, or how many, many grand college bound, or whether they're going to go to graduate school. Or, or the path taken, right, exactly. So very good. Uh, great information. Thanks, Rebecca and Jody. And I think here I just uh, wanted to point out you know, there's a lot to consider. So it, it goes beyond just uh, it, being a fan of a sports team and wanting to go to, to <laughs> the college there. It's, there's a lot more that goes into it. And uh, as you can, as you heard, there's considerations both for how to save, what are good vehicles for that, but also all the considerations uh, that go into, uh, you know, the process of, of the admissions process. And, and The but, last thing you want is for a kid to take six years because they're in the wrong place. Right. Or they transfer twice. Um, and so some, uh, it's the best fit, not just academically, but financially and socially mm -hmm. and culturally. Um, it's no longer just about the sweatshirt and the mask. Right. Well, thanks. On behalf of Manning and Pierre and Jody Rosenstein-Atkin, Thank you again and have a great day.